In space, no one can hear you scream. This phrase, one that has endured over decades of disaffiliation and disambiguation from its source, remains the bone-chilling promise at the heart of Ridley Scott's 1979 horror film, Alien. It's an ominous, enticing premise that, much like the trailer for the film itself, works much harder to convey a sense of tone and atmosphere than a complete picture of what exactly you are about to see. But what is it about an unheard scream that is so inherently, innately unsettling? By 1979, the scream had already comfortably settled into its place as a quintessential brick in the architecture of the horror canon. But plenty has been written about the significance of the scream as an instrument of evoking fear. I want to explore horror as an oral product of the body, and within that framework construct an interpretation of why this implementation of sonic body horror is so viscerally effective, and has remained so for the better part of a century. Hey, look, in the corner, this I gotta see. Cutting edge visual effects, blood, gore and monstrous creatures. These are all tried and tested ways to elicit fear in a visual medium. But they're expensive, and in the early 20th century, subject to the ruthless censorship and standards of a much more puritanical society. Translating horror storytelling into an oral space offered a workaround to these issues. Stripping away the visual element of horror gave storytellers the flexibility to plumb the catacombs of their imagination without having to worry about budgetary or technological constraints or pearl-clutching ratings boards breathing down their necks. This let horror broadcasts carve out a space for themselves separate from the campier, more family-friendly brand of horror that was dominating theaters in the early 1930s. One of the most enduring examples of these broadcasts was Orson Welles' 1938 production of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. The broadcast translated Wells' story to an American setting, changing the names of crucial cities, and was infamously so convincing that it inspired doomsday mobs of hysterical citizens to fill the streets. I think it's crucial that Orson Welles, under fire for the mayhem that he caused, has replied, You don't play murder in soft words. In 1934, four years before War of the Worlds drove listeners across the country into a state of hysteria, Willis Cooper tapped into a much blunter vein of the horror broadcast. Lights Out was a midnight horror anthology series, each episode delving into a short but bloody tale that famously transfixed and horrified audiences. While Cooper's original run on the series has been unfortunately lost to time, it's still remembered for its graphic renditions of gruesome violence, content that had a way of getting under its listeners' skin. One detail that stuck in my mind in particular was that Cooper's team would use the peeling of duct tape to simulate the sound of flesh being rended from the body. I can't leave you. You saw what they did to her. Look at her. Inside out. A woman inside out. They're coming faster and faster. Like long black fingers. No, you... You thing, whatever you want, get off me. I've got to get out of here. I've got to tell them all about you. I've got to tell everyone there's something like you loose in the world. When we hear of this slippery fog cloaking a man in darkness and pulling his skin inside out, it scares us as not only a listener, but as a speaker, disrupting the comfortable paradigm of listener and media that allows us to slip into a role of passivity. This experience registers as one that we cannot possibly have a frame of reference for. It becomes our responsibility to take the agency to conjure it for ourselves.
When Jeffrey Beaumont finds a dismembered ear in the middle of a field, it serves as a critical awakening for both his character and the audience. Blue Velvet's ear is a disruption, a catalyst for a violent ejection of the audience and characters from the quiet world that they thought they knew. There's a particular significance of the ear to Beaumont's story, and the story that director David Lynch is trying to tell through the film. There's a recurring motif throughout of eavesdropping, observing, a voyeuristic tendency that not only belongs to Beaumont, but many of the characters that he surrounds himself with. The ear, in this sense, serves as a portal of sorts, a doorway into the unknown, the underbelly of this small town, one like any other. The discovery of the ear gives a grotesque undertone to the listening and to the listeners in the events that follow, defiling and tainting the act of listening as something that goes against nature and humanity itself. This strain of unnatural listening, the alienation and dehumanization of the listener, can be a powerful tool in evoking suspense and fear. One scene in particular in Alex Garland's 2018 film Annihilation employs this technique very deliberately and to great effect. Among the many creatures that our protagonists encounter within the extraterrestrial zone, this bear is easily the most dangerous and the most horrifying. Putting aside the wonderfully gross character design, let's explore what makes this bear, if you can even call it a bear, so effectively creepy from an oral perspective. First, I want to play an example of the sound this creature makes. Listen to this. The wails, the clicking, the low growls, there's something almost mechanical about the way that this bear communicates. It sounds manufactured, processed, almost harvested from a human host. In the audience, we know that the voice that we're hearing out of its mouth is that of one of the protagonists, a character who had been found dead hours before, presumably killed by this very creature. But I think that what this sound does so effectively goes far beyond simple mimicry. An essential theme of Annihilation is replication and mutation. As the characters travel deeper and deeper into the zone, they come to realize that the extraterrestrial force controlling the area is mimicking and altering DNA, not only of the creatures who live there already, but of the explorers themselves, drawing them farther and farther from their biological humanity as they near closer and closer to the epicenter of this mysterious event. This idea is taken so far that the film's climax revolves around a fight between the protagonist and a manufactured replica of herself. The film takes great lengths to make clear that the inhuman force infecting this land is not so technological as it is an organism, a conscious being that sees replication and imitation as a means of survival. The bear scene, on top of being the scariest in the film, is a critical inflection point for the character's understanding of this. Through the unwitting bear, twisted beyond terrestrial recognition, the alien force establishes itself as both speaker and, crucially, listener, running a human voice through the same process of replicating and mutating that it does the rest of the natural world. What makes this scene doubly terrifying is the power of possession and control that is heavily implied within it. Through stealing her voice, the alien force can mimic her humanity and, in the ears of her companions, take on her identity. As their genetic makeup is altered by their exposure to this force, humanity becomes something of a dwindling and precious resource to our central characters. Through the bear, they must face the reality that the walls between the human and the inhuman are much more tenuous than they had thought. We are born of the blood, made men by the blood, undone by the blood. Our eyes 
hands are yet to open. Fear the old blood. When an element of interactivity is introduced into the listener-speaker dynamic of media, the potential for oral terror is significantly expanded beyond the one-way mirror of film or radio. Suddenly, the audience-turned-player can not only listen, but be listened to in the ways that they interact with the world they find themselves in and the different sounds that they can uncover within that world. And interactive media has found no limit to how sound can be used to tell a story. Hidden dialogue options, voice recording, manipulated audio files, duplicated voice lines, even cut content varied under metadata and code. Some of the deepest secrets and most primal reactions are locked away behind sonic puzzles that are up to the player to unlock. It's difficult to find a more complex, challenging, and engaging example of this concept than Hidetaka Miyazaki's Bloodborne. The narrative, a city plagued by beasts and blood, a healing church devoted to making connection with some primordial race of gods, is the skeletal backdrop to the world of mystery and monsters that the player is tasked with deciphering. Listening plays a crucial role in unlocking a certain side of this mystery. Oral motifs sprinkled throughout the story hold unrevealed significance. Eavesdropped conversations between unseen enemies reveal a patchwork of history through which the unraveling of the city is unveiled. Artificially manipulated voice lines of allies and enemies alike reveal connections only ever hinted at through the sparse narrative presented to the player. What so effectively sets Bloodborne apart from Annihilation or Lights Out is the role of agency on behalf of the listener. These aren't lines of dialogue spoken by characters on a screen and designated for a universal audience to hear. Bloodborne's secrets are deliberately set for the player to hear for themselves, and some require considerable effort for the privileged to do so. What makes these secrets so critically important, and what ties Bloodborne's storytelling techniques into the concepts of orality and horror that I've delved into today, is how they pull the listener closer and closer to what Bloodborne refers to as the Eldritch Truth a primordial way of perceiving reality that stands in utter contradiction to humanity to the point that it drives those men who seek it to madness. Throughout Bloodborne, one sonic motif is repeated possibly more than any other, the disembodied crying of an infant. It's a sound that follows us from the beginning of the story, growing louder and louder as we near the eldritch truth. As the story nears its end, we too reach the source of the wailing, a cradle in the ruins of a nursery, and guarded by a faceless being of immense power. We find the cradle empty, the infant formless, having ascended the physical plane to manifest itself in a dimension of sound and thought. It's a spine-tingling realization that this sound, so innately linked to the physicality of human life, has been untethered from its speaker and freed from the confines of the body. One of the most important elements of Bloodborne's story is learning about the efforts taken by a maniacal group of individuals to try to contact some higher being existing on a different plane. This ending teaches us that it is through sound and voice that this connection can be bridged and these beings can be spoken to and heard. Throughout this video, I've focused on the relationship between the natural and the unnatural, and how the act of listening and speaking can serve as a bridge between the two, a gateway to the other side of this truth, and a path from the listener to a speaker that they might not want to face. What I've tried to do is paint a portrait of how the relationship between speaker and listener can coax out a deeper, more primal fear. There are ultimately some truths, it seems, that are better left beyond our reach. Truly effective oral horror can confront us with these truths in ways that are practically impossible through traditional visual media. It's that reality that makes Annihilation scary beyond, oh look, that's a creepy bear. It's what makes Bloodborne terrifying, not when you see the grotesque beasts that inhabit this world, but when you pause and listen to what they have to say. Thank you.